today, we're happy to have Kintronica Labs uh, sponsor us. Uh, they're in Northeast Tennessee, as you know, a worldwide uh, reputation for top quality products and services since 1949. And so they uh, like to be thought of as the antenna system supplier. I've already arranged for Tom King to come talk to us. Uh, it'll be next month and we'll have a good chat that day. Uh, and they want to provide a maximally flat load impedance uh, that's going to complement the modern AM transmitters for analog or digital modulation. The backbone of the value that Kentronic Labs provides to the AM broadcast owner is an in-house developed set of software tools, CKTNet and ArrayPAT, that enable their team to design complex multi-frequency, multi-tower shared antenna systems that are particularly suited for the case where the owners decide to sell a property and then multiplex on another station. Kentronic Labs also provides an array of FM products, including FM combiners, coax switches, LPFM weatherproof equipment racks, and FM dummy loads from 5 to 50 kilowatts. From the concept to on-air, Kentronic Labs has the products and services you need. Please check them out. www.kentronic.com Good people. Now, uh, let us... Uh, introduce our special guest for today, Jeff Welton. Now, um, what we want to talk about today uh, primarily is using that AUI, and not all transmitters have it. You know, remote control systems, you get the power output and you get the, the maybe the temperature of the room, and if it's sold transmitter, you get voltage and current. Uh, but the Nautel AUI has really been good in uh, giving us uh, more to see and more to understand. And I thought it'd be really neat uh, for Jeff to spend a little time with us and show us what we can get out of this AUI in terms of understanding the transmitter and answer some questions. And so Jeff, let's, uh, let's hear what you have to say to get started. All righty, and, and I'm going to preface it to make it a little less, uh, you know me, I, I suck at sales pitches, I'm bad at them, and it just sounds terrible when I try to do one. So Will, Wilson's nodding his head in the background already because he's heard me try to do a sales pitch, and it, it's a groaner. So we're not going there except a preface with the um, caveat that we're not the only ones that have an AUI anymore. So, you know, definitely if you've got a new toy that's got a user interface, it's a really good idea to take some time and invest it in figuring out what kind of tools it provides. And I mean, obviously I'm gonna talk about our AUI because well, that's the one I know, but uh, that, that, that's just sort of the thing to take away no matter what gear you're running, whether it's us, Gates Air, anybody else with an AUI and uh, afraid to admit that, well, obviously I'm focused on the ones with the big N on them, but uh, you know, just learn what the stuff will do because sometimes, what do they say? Uh, I, I was do, talking to somebody the other day and oh, uh, Tuesday session, we were talking about uh, holiday gift ideas and uh, I said there were a lot of things presented in that session that I didn't know I needed because I didn't know they existed until that session. So um, that that's kind of what I want to look at is some of the instrumentation on this because there, there's default screens that come up when you turn a transmitter on. And, and a lot of folks, that's just where it stays forever and they don't really dig in to see what else is there. So if I don't screw this up, I am going to try the screen sharing. Oh, well, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to fix that. Sorry, you got it now. That's it, because I mean, I can. Uh, I, I talk. Uh, I, I call it Acadian with the best of them. It's almost like Italian or or Louisiana French, where you know you need your hands as much as your uh, mouth to discuss something. But I can't paint a picture of a spectrum analyzer with my hands, not properly. So hopefully. You should be looking at my screen there. Indeed. And I am going to modify my other screen to see a little more of what I want to see here. There we go. All right. So this is a 400 kilowatt. And the cool thing about user interfaces in general is before when you had a high power AM or a low power FM, 
or anything in between, typically the metering you got was what was applicable to that specific transmitter. And, you know, low power gear, we weren't going to invest a whole lot of resources into putting umpteen levels of metering on something that sells for a nickel 95. You know, I mean, there's, there's just not a lot of margin in that. And uh, ultimately, we got to make enough money to stay afloat because you kind of want to call us for support in a couple of years. So the AUI and, and going with these digital displays was cool because it means that we can standardize across the board. So when you log into a VS300, you're going to see the same displays as you would see on a GV40 HD rig. Um, I believe it's the same with the Flexiva. It's a low power, high power. You get the ability to have the same level of metering even on the lower pro lower cost, uh, lower uh, power gear. And, and that's really cool. Now, because of that, the, the, it's like I say, it, it creates some uh, commonality is I guess the word I want to use. So it uh, there's less of a learning curve. Of course, from a manufacturer perspective, there's more incentive to standardize on our gear all the way through because there's less to learn or somebody else's gear, I guess, but we don't want to go down that road. Anyway, so we're looking at the 400 kilowatt, the default, and you've got audio inputs, mod levels, because it's got built-in mod monitor. The Smith chart we're going to touch on a little bit. That's pretty cool. And some transmitters will have spectrum analyzers, some won't. It depends a lot. And, and this is where it is critical. Um, we've, we've beaten the drum on software updates before, and a lot of people are, I don't mess with it if it's working, but, uh, software updates are where we add features and like going, if you look at the, the VS or the NV light, any of our FM rigs, the earlier ones, they had a spectrum analyzer, which was really cool. Um, in a later edition, we added uh, baseband spectrum analysis. In a later edition, again, we added an audio oscilloscope. And depending on your software update, you may or may not have access to those tools. And some of them, again, are, are pretty useful. So that's what you look at on the main screen. Well, you see the four little displays that are selected there at the moment. Each of them has an X in the corner. And you can shut that display down. And you can go into the menu, not the main menu, which is the one most people will select. But if you click on the little cogwheel that appears when one of those is shut off, you'll get the tool menu and you can pick the tools that are appropriate to that transmitter. Now, what we're looking at here is the one specifically from my uh, little one kilowatt that I've talked about before. And uh, this was an on the air signal. So this is why I'm doing it as a slideshow instead of a show and tell because the odds of me hitting the wrong button and taking us down are, are a lot higher. If I'm doing it live, so we're well, just we want to we want to see you do it. <laughs> yeah, no. Then there's this stunned. Oops, shouldn't have done that out loud. Uh, actually, usually the uh, comment that is uh, not fit for publication, and I know you're recording and streaming, so it's better if I don't do it live. Now there are a lot of things, and Barry and I had this conversation the other day. Signal constellation is really only useful if you're running HD because it looks at each of the digital carriers and plots the MER, the uh, deviation between where they actually land on the constellation and where in, they would land in an ideal perfect world. And it's when you're looking at an HD signal, it's a wonderful tool because uh, the, the more it's spread out, typically it means that you've got load issues that you wanna deal with. Uh, you can see your antenna icing up uh, by watching the signal change. Uh, you can tell whether you should tweak your spectrum efficiency optimizer if you've got one of our boxes or, you know, maybe adjust the RTAC if you've got one of the Gates Air boxes or select another uh, pre-correction algorithm if you've got a BE. So I guess I do know a little bit about all these things, just, just enough to be dangerous anyway. But anyway, so for HD, that's wonderful. For analog, it's pretty much useless. I mean, it, it's just because you, your signal is a dot. So there's nothing to look at. The oscilloscope I like a lot. We'll talk about that in a bit. The Lissajou plot. Uh, any old school oscilloscope users, you know, everybody's done left and right as X and Y on oscilloscope and looked at the Lissajou, I hope. And, uh, you know, diagonal uh, lower left to upper right means everything's in phase and good. Uh, if it's going upper left to lower right, you got to line out of phase. If it's totally horizontal, you're missing your right channel. If it's totally vertical, you're missing your left channel. 
So fastest way to troubleshoot an audio signal going when you're looking at left and right. Um, so it's useful for that. All of the EQ ones, EQ filter delay, frequency response, and impulse response are pre-corrections that we do inside the transmitter itself to correct for any non-linearities in the uh, amplifier, just to, to give you better um, frequency response curves when you run an audio proof. For the average user, those are not going to serve any purpose at all in, in normal use. Uh, they, we use them in test on occasion, and on the very rare occasion, somebody might ask you to get a screenshot if you're troubleshooting an audio issue. But for the most part, you're just not going to look at them. Um, however, we left them there because, again, they come in handy for tests, and someday you may have to send it home. Um, audio processor, obviously, that's the um, input and uh, gain and uh, clipping and all that great stuff. Um, then we'll hit that one in a little more detail in a bit. Uh, spectrum analyzer I mentioned briefly. So what I'm going to do is highlight some of them. Now on the AM, we do have the network analyzer. We don't have it on FM because you don't really plot the Smith chart much for FM. You do an impedance sweep and uh, once it's set up, it's pretty much there. But where AMs tend to be, well, number one, on the ground where you can reach them, um, so they do need a, a little more tweaking or they do get a little more tweaking. It, it's kind of cool to have a real-time spectrum analyzer. Now, what I didn't show on this one because it's a screenshot was that you can take your uh, mouse and click on the actual display. And if, if you click on the little red curve with the uh, impedance sweep, uh, which is normalized to 50J0, which would be the apex to the right, then uh, if you click on that little curve, you're going to see the um, offset from center frequency, from carrier frequency, and you're going to read the offset from the 50J0 normalized reading. So in the top corner, it would say something like minus five kilohertz, minus uh, 0.5 plus J.2 or something. And so you can tell the exact frequency response of your antenna system right off the bat. And again, for HD, this is critical because an HD signal won't work into a less than optimal load. But uh, the amazing thing, and I know Clay's in, usually in here somewhere. I don't, I've only got eight or nine people on the screen. So I'm gonna hope that Clay's here, but uh, he, he's talked a lot about it before, but for analog AM, I mean, the antenna system is critical. It's, I tell people it's like the speakers on your home stereo. You can have the best Macintosh amplifier, carvers, whatever going. And uh, if you're running it into a set of $10 Walmart speakers, it's gonna sound like hammered dog crap. So, you know, your antenna system is your speakers. And if it's not properly set up, your AM's not gonna perform as well, whether it's analog or digital. This is digital. This is especially yeah. a good point, Jeff, and I'll, I'll interrupt to, to bring this out. When you change transmitter makers, you <coughs> often do not get a very good output plot because the output network from Nortel is going to be different from an old Gates Harris or BE or, or something like that. And this is the perfect way, even for somebody that's just got a one kilowatt or a five kilowatt non-D that they can verify where their si signal is. Well, and it goes a step further than that, because with the old rigs, of course, you had the tuning and the loading built into them. So what happened is the antenna system degraded over time. Rather than fixing the problem, you solved the symptom by adjusting the transmitter. And that works great until you replace the transmitter. And then if you've got loading and tuning, you've got to figure out how to walk it in all over again. Or if you've got one without that, then you've got to fix the antenna system. And is this, so, um, yeah. is, the, is the Smith chart? here uh, based on uh, what it's seeing coming uh, on the outside of the transmitter rather than uh, we used to uh, look at it uh, at the plates of the tubes uh, so before the output network. Where we're looking here is at the output of the amplifier or of the exciter, but because we have ex we've got very known nonlinearity between the um, through the amplifier and through the filter, so we automatically compensate for that. So we're simulating the transmitter output, but looking physically at the exciter output. Okay, that's interesting. You're not seeing the, you don't see the antenna at the uh, exciter output though. 
No, but if, well, if again, I'm compensating for the uh, transmitter, the amplifier stage and the filter stage. So what you're looking at is effectively, if you put a network analyzer on the transmitter output, it will look like that. Okay. Like I say, the, these transmitters are very, very consistent when it comes, I mean, the, the deviation on them is less than a tenth of a dB typically. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm thinking that uh, one thing that we had to do back in the day uh, was uh, you're, you're showing the, uh, the horseshoe sure. opening to the left. Yeah, and we, we, we might have a, uh, you know, a 90 degree shift in the uh, output network. So yep, at yep. the tube, we would want it to open to the left. At the mm -hmm. actual output, we might want it to be pointing down or something like that. Right. And so for us, we do want to see it open to the left at the output, and then we'll do the phase shift to bring it back to the, uh, to the uh, transmitter amplifiers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, that, and that is the other cool thing about the, all this mapping is because we know what we want to see, we can compensate on the fly pretty much for, for a lot of it. And that uh, makes it quite a bit easier. Something also yeah. is interesting is that the yeah. Smith chart, we typically would do a, uh, a sweep of the RF, but this is live and it's based on the actual audio or sidebands that are, that are doing the excitation and you're seeing the Smith chart based on them, right? Right. It's doing basically doing a fast Fourier transform of the uh, entire complex waveform of the output. Sim and I, it's not simultaneously. It is pretty much a sweep. It's just a high speed sweep limited by the computer clock. So yeah, it, it's exactly what it's doing. And it is live and it is based on the broadcast signal. Obviously, if I'm broadcasting a one kilohertz tone, then I'm not going to have a full 15 kilohertz sweep because I don't have any signal to drive out there. Great. Thank you. Yeah. This is yeah. Brady Boats. Um, hey. I just spent a couple of uh, three days at a radio station here in the Boston Metro that's about to turn on all digital AM, and they have a brand new uh, three kilowatt transmitter from you guys. What's that, an NV3? Is that what that is? Uh, if it's AM, it's an NX3. NX3, okay. Um, yep. And we were looking at the diagram uh, to that transmitter to find out exactly where, where it looked like that Smith chart was getting its feed. And mm -hmm. it looked in the diagram like you were picking it off right after the power amplifiers were summed and before the output network, which is okay. the optimal place to measure for AMHD. As a matter of fact, uh, David Maxson's book, way back in the day in the beginning of HD, uh, mm -hmm. in chapter 12, where they talk about that, um, uh, that's exactly uh, where they need to know what the, right. um, what, what, the, what the Smith chart plot looks like because it needs to be symmetrical about the line of resistance at that point. And I was very happy to see that the NX3, uh, in fact, appeared to be looking there. Um, and it also, I had made measurements outside the transmitter right at its output terminals and then uh, of several feet of coax, maybe 50 feet of coax away at the input mm -hmm. to the antenna system and then at the power divider in the directional array. And mm -hmm. every place where it shifted in phase, it looked like it was gonna shift to, to very close to where it needed to be by the time it got to the power divider. And I was amazed that it was pretty good there. Yeah. And Brady, is that WSRO? As a matter of fact, it is, yes. Yeah, yeah. and that is very possible. Uh, I don't know, I mean, on the higher power gear, I know we used to just do exciter and then, like I say, extrapolate for the amplifiers because they were so consistent. So it is very possible that the sample's coming off the amplifier output. I know back in the day before we had this stuff, we used to provide on some of the XR series, we provided sample points for volts and current that were tapped off of the common point after the combiner. So, yep, it, that, that's quite possible. I'd have to look at a schematic to be sure. All right. Um, let's see, the other thing you can do on this uh, over and above is once you click on it, if you want to use your left and right arrows, you can scroll your cursor across the waveform as well. Uh, so that's something that's kind of useful to know. And you see the plus and the minus on the top bar, you can, uh, you can zoom in and zoom out that way as well. 
So uh, that, uh, like I say, it, it's just a, a good uh, tool to have. Now, Ken's asked me in chat, and, and I'll uh, throw it out in the public just because uh, it's easier for me to do it that way than to try to type and talk at the same time. That that would be a highly dangerous uh, endeavor. But uh, Ken's asked if the new AUI, the non-Flash AUI, has this. And the short answer is, at this point, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen the NX prototypes of the new AUI yet. I know the plan is that it absolutely will have it at some point, whether it's in the first beta or the second beta or the full release, I can't answer that. But uh, down the road, yes, it will. So uh, that was, uh, it, it's considered to be one of the, I, I call it a critical tool. It's, like Grady said, it's, uh, it's just really nice to be able to see what you're supposed to be seeing and, and have something dynamic so you don't have to like shut down and run a test. It's just always there. So it and on a digital signal where you're uh, covering a good chunk of the broadcast band with it, it uh, it gives you a pretty good uh, resolution as well. All right, the other thing we've got in the FMs and some of the AMs, and I don't know if it's consistent with all of the AMs. And and again, this is where uh, your mileage may vary. So definitely research your own product. But uh, is a spectrum analyzer. And the cool thing about the spectrum analyzer in our gear on the FM boxes is that you can set the RBW and the span. Now the span, you can only go up to, I think 1200 kilohertz, 1 1.2 megahertz. So you're only gonna be able to look a channel on either side. It's not going to give you harmonic readings as an example. You need a proper spectrum analyzer for that. But for looking at the near end stuff, that's useful. What I use it for most, if you look at measurement source, if you click that little drop arrow, one of the options is uh, MPX, and you can look at the uh, composite signal with it. And so I look at the baseband signal a lot. As a matter of fact, I look at it because I've got an at a glance, left plus right, pilot, left minus right, S or RDS uh, in this case, if I was running any subcarriers, they'd be out there to the right again. So, you know, it just gives me a very quick at a glance and I can see the relative levels. You know, I don't expect once I set my pilot that it's going to change. I don't expect that my RDS injection is going to change. And yes, the RDS injection on this is a tad low. We found for our particular terrain, 4% works best for what we want to do. Um, if uh, Alan's ever listening to this, I apologize, Alan. I know it should be higher. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, you know, just the, the way we set it up. And it's a quick at a glance. And again, you can uh, click on it with the... Uh, with your uh, cursor and see exactly what you're looking at and the amplitude relative to carrier. So if you wanted to break that down and do the math, you could figure out the actual injection level that I've got the pilot set to as an example. You know, um, and it's just, again, it's, it's a cool tool to be able to tell if all the signals are there. Am I gonna use it every day? No, I don't look at it every day. I mean, I glance at it whenever I happen to log into my transmitter just because it's the fastest way to tell if everything is where it should be. But uh, beyond that, I don't spend a whole lot of time on it. Okay, again, we have the uh, carrier. The one good thing that this is useful for, and like I said, it's looking at close in. If you're running HD, it's got the uh, HD shoulders on there. You can set it for NRSC mask, or I think it's got some um, other options for setting the mask itself. Uh, again, you can set the averaging, you can set the resolution bandwidth and the span. So it's really good for looking at your HD injection. Okay, um, the cool thing about that is, and I had an example of this just last week, uh, we had somebody lost a bay off their tower and uh, they, they called us up and they said, uh, the HD's dropping out. And I said, huh, I said, let me see your spectrum analyzer. They sent me a screenshot and I said, your load's gone sideways because one of their HD sidebands, instead of being flat across the top, was at about a 45 degree angle. And uh, so the load impedance had uh, is gone away. And, and that's what it turned out to be. They discovered a bay had fallen off. I, I don't think it quite fell off. I think somebody probably stepped on it or something. I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, you know, again, one of those useful tools that uh, you don't use on a regular basis, but it does come in quite handy here and there. And again, that's what I was uh, saying. Uh, this is the oscilloscope display. And I use the oscilloscope for two things. I, I like the INQ display because it gives me a very quick 
left and right picture of my audio. And I mean, it's that's just a snapshot of whatever we were broadcasting on Cove FM at uh, about uh, an hour and 20 minutes ago, give or take. So, um, you know, it, it just gives me a quick IQ representation. I can also look at the uh, LNR, the, the left and right audio, and uh, get an idea of what kind of separation I've got if I'm uh, running mono or, again, if both signals are actually there. So uh, that, that's a cool tool from that perspective as well. Um, it can also, you can look at the pre-correction if you're uh, running uh, HD signal. And you can look at the composite. Uh, we don't run composite on Cove. We're running uh, AES EBU out of a uh, <coughs> barracks unit. But uh, hey, the thing hasn't dropped out in uh, knock on wood five years on air. So uh, that, no, not true. It's dropped out once the power went out. But uh, there's your list of you. And again, we run a fair bit of separation and we are running a digital demodulated signal so it looks like crap um i apologize for that but our listeners like it and they're the ones paying the bills so um you know that is uh, again left and right if it's running like this your left and right are both there and in phase and i know gordon's done a lot of talks and papers about uh, left and right he probably speak audio much much better than i could and uh, i can see he's got the perplex face saying that's the ugliest audio signal i've ever seen but uh, the uh, asymmetry of that is interesting. It's not going very far down in the left. Yeah. And other times it's splattered all over the place. And I am not 100% sure why. To be honest, it's the first time I've ever really looked at it because that's not a display I usually have up. And uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be playing with that once I have some free time this weekend. Jeff, you're wrong. That's not the ugliest I've ever seen. Oh, okay. Well, good. The, that was on my uh, NV40 when we first put it on the air. And you know mm -hmm. exactly what was wrong with it, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, again, it's a good way to tell you if something is awry. I mean, if, if you've got a, a, as I said before, if you've got a flat horizontal line, you're missing your right channel. If you've got a totally vertical line, you're missing your left channel. If it's uh, going top left to bottom right, then you're out of phase. And what I got here? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that was all I had to do for screen share. And so I'll stop share or you can stop share and uh, let's see what you got now. You wear what you ask for, Jeff. I didn't expect to be playing. I'll show me mine if you show me yours today. <laughs> but And it does look like they suddenly dropped the right channel again. I assume you can see this. Yep, you're left channel only. And see, I have yet to figure out, I got to talk to engineering and see what it means when it uh, does the Rorschach plot. Because <laughs> that doesn't look like any oscilloscope signal I've ever seen. And I don't know why their right channel is kicking and kicking out. That's just something it's, that just started. Yep. And I see you've got the audio processor up. And yeah, like I said, the EQ frequency response, that's uh, an in-house thing. I usually, um, do you have the ability to put the uh, oscilloscope up? I don't think we have this in the... Uh, oh, somebody's got to do a software update. The VS300. Well, I'm, my picture's a VS1. Now, I haven't said that. My VS1 is also running a contraband software set on it. So <laughs> that well, may or may not have... Well, the CR transmitter gets to be the beta for Nautel, so it runs a lot of stuff on it that doesn't necessarily exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it uh, is definitely an entertaining thing. Well, if you can get me a copy, I'll be happy to uh, apply it. What software are you running there right now? This is the Legacy 1.02. Can the, you listen to audio? At the no, same no. What, uh, what software are you running on the transmitter, though? Uh, hit the menu. Okay. And hit uh, system settings, I think. I'll be wrong 100% of the time. Nope. Upgrade software. I got lucky. Oh, you want, nope. you want upgrade software? Okay. Nope. 
Okay, hit, uh, yeah, whatever. Um, no, don't proceed, just exit out. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Does it? There we go. So, yeah, you're at 4.2.6, and uh, version 5.2 will give you the oscilloscope, but I wouldn't bother doing it because you're going to be upgrading it again to the, uh, the new AUI probably in a month or two or three. I don't know. What did Matt say there a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. You know, he, he, he's a combination of marketing and engineering, so whatever he said, double it, but, but that. Something that would be interesting, especially uh, where Barry was seeing left channel only, would be mm -hmm. to uh, be able to uh, stream the uh, audio to his browser so he yes. could uh, tell what's going on. That has been put on the wish list. I don't know if you'll see it happen with the, I, I know you won't see it with the beta at the new AUI, but yeah, we consistently see, get those kind of requests and, and that is definitely something that's put on the product list. Um, one of the other things that we've done with the later renditions of the, uh, of the software update is to give you the ability on the front panel, I don't know if we can do it on the version 5 AUI, but at least on the front panel of the transmitter, you can stream the RDS data. So you can look at the transmitter and see the RDS data to tell you right off the bat whether the signal is actually getting from the automation system to the transmitter. And because historically that's one of the biggest challenges we find is that it's not an issue with the configuration of the RDS data coming out of the wide orbit or, or automation system or whatever brand. And it's typically not the transmitter's ability to broadcast it. It's the getting point A to point B connected that seems to uh, give most folks the hiccups. So uh, being able to look at the transmitter and say, oh, yeah, no, we got the signal. We're good. That uh, makes a big difference. Anything else you want me to show? This, this, will this work? <laughs> so basically, every time it pulls the alarms, it's telling you your analog rate audio is low. So, yep, that uh, it's a good thing you don't have that set up to email you every time it generates an alarm. That could get annoying fast. That, that could. Yeah. So seems like, it's, been a, seems right. like it's been a problem. Yeah. One other thing I found that was a great use for the Lisa Ju plot was. Uh, when I lost one side of a balanced audio connection, uh, mm -hmm. I could at a not a 45 degree angle, not a one to one tilt, uh, but yep. it was either particularly high or particularly low. And I could see that like my left side had a plus but not a minus uh, mm -hmm. on the XLR plug or something. Yep. And, and that uh, may come back to what um, Harold noticed with the asymmetry on ours, where it's shooting more to the top right and less to the bottom left. We may be missing a, uh, a minus on, uh, on or a plus, depending. So that, that's a good point, too. And uh, But then again, like I say, we're pretty sure we're running AES uh, at the moment. I don't I think we're running balance. Anything else you'd like me to pop up here? No, I'm good to go. I mean, we, we've beaten an AUI over the head. I'm sure people have heard more than they, they ever wanted to hear about that sort of thing. Great um, comment on uh, asymmetry from my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, an announcer who speaks loudly and within an inch of the microphone generally will done it to create very asymmetrical audio. So mm -hmm. if a announcer blows by that's rah, 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 into the mic, that may be, that could be it. You never know. Let's see, three, two o'clock on a Thursday. That's very possible with us because that would have been Steve on the air. So if I happen to grab the screenshot and I wasn't, okay, I, I'll say it out loud on record even, I wasn't listening to our station at the time I took the screenshot. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's uh, that that's always a possibility too. So uh, I'll play with that a little more though. It's, it, again, like I say, the I pick up more anomalies with our station when I'm doing stuff like this and showing it to people that know more than I do. Yeah, asymmetry of, of voice is um, interesting and it does vary person to person. Uh, I had to put in a switch to uh, switch microphone phase depending upon who was uh, on the air in order to get, get higher positive peaks. And then also uh, headphone phase switch so that their uh, voice didn't cancel in their head. Yeah, and that, that was one of the other things that is kind of new and unique to me and 
until, you know, I'd, I'd heard of it, but hadn't really considered it until I started uh, playing with this more often was that some people, their voices seem to go more one way than the other way. And I didn't think that I, I still can't wrap my head around the physics. So if somebody can explain that, I'd be interested. Uh, I won't bother going into the physics, but it, uh, just a general thing. If you have someone whose voice sounds, I'll use the word mellow, just very, you know, uh, very smooth. Generally, it's symmetrical, where someone whose voice is a little more edgy would be asymmetrical. And that's a very loose generalization. Mm -hmm. I think that's a thing of uh, their the vo vocal cords are a class C amplifier. And if you've got resonance after it, it makes it round again. Hmm. Yeah, you know, Harold, that's a pretty good analogy. <laughs> Actually, that switch thing uh, goes back years and years. I remember the old KPOL in uh, Los Angeles had a switch with a position for each announcer. So they had analyzed the voices. Well, there was an old, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the brand. It was an early AM processor. For, I think it was Yuri. U-R-E-I, that had a, uh, um, a, a, a built-in switch where it would dynamically uh, switch the audio to maintain um, uh, po uh, the positive peaks as the highest. I think the uh, CBS Volume X did that and it drove disc jockeys crazy because their voice kept disappearing in their headphones. Yeah, the Symmetrics had a uh, a rotator, I believe, in theirs that would keep the positive and negative correct. And then there's the Con uh, Symmetric Peak that uh, was a phase scrambler to make it symmetrical. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's various ways to approach that. And um, believe it or not, they, this comes out in um, the sound systems as well. Um, if you if you're dealing with a sound system and you get someone who gets up to speak and they it's I mean they've got a good strong voice but through the sound system they sound real wimpy just flip the phase and I'll bet you it fixes it face chaser no a face chaser doesn't sound good you know, especially in a in a sound system um, Wasn't the phase chaser uh, doing between left and right on cart machines, right? You don't have that with a microphone. Right. Uh, well, yeah. And this is just an absolute, absolute phase where what's happening is that the, uh, the phase of their voice is being canceled by the audio from the sound system. I actually turned on a radio and I'm kind of, I've got my uh, station up on the screen and listening and just to look at the, uh, at the, um, listen to you on it. And it's kind of sort of balanced when they're playing music. So I think it may be the uh, DJ, but uh, here, let's, let's see if we can throw that back up there again, screen two and turn this clock radio up a notch and you get a musical interlude if i did it right yeah that looks better yeah and so that's uh let's say it uh runs around quite a bit uh depending on what the the program's doing but uh it definitely does seem to mostly center off there so i have a sneaking suspicion we've got a grand total of uh 30 volunteers at this station and uh yeah we don't uh differentiate they all use uh, most of them these days broadcast from home and uh you know on on something like this little usb mic that i've got with me but uh 
it's it is what it is for community radio. They're uh, they're doing okay. So there's now a, a lot of uh, other equipment at transmitter sites with a SNMP interface. Can the AUI bring all that together to a unified view? So not so much. You've got the ability to um, tie in to a. Uh, You've got the ability to tie external contact closures in and uh, uh, fire statuses with it. But yeah, no, the AUI, you, you couldn't merge anything else into it at this point. And I'd be honest, I don't think we'll ever go there. Um, I mean, the, if you look at, uh, I don't know if anybody's doing anything like that at the moment. I mean, the ArcTouch Plus, uh, some of the dedicated remotes that handle SNMP, you can uh, bring multiple devices in and then build your uh, multi-stage display from that. But I don't think we've got really any intention of reinventing that wheel at this point. Now, I'll never say never because, you know, who knows what could happen. If we thought there was enough demand for it and we could sell more transmitters doing it, then absolutely we'd consider it. Room yeah, temp yeah. would be nice. A which? Room temp. Yeah. And, and I suppose you're going to want that in Fahrenheit, right? <laughs> well, most of the transmitters now do have an ambient temperature monitor. Uh, the VSs, I don't believe, do, but most of the bigger ones, you can uh, you can find ambient temp in the controls. If That's you probably into... uh, like uh, input and output temperature, and input would be ambient? Yes. Well, it's actually marked as ambient temperature in the uh, in the NV lights anyway. So the, the NV lights and the GV use the exact same platform. And uh, the NX AMs, I think, are very similar. So um, is a lot of this data uh, available for other devices to pick up by SNMP? Yes. Now, okay. the, the oscilloscope and the, the, the dynamic stuff, like the spectrum analyzer, we don't spit that data out because to put that out on an SNMP stream would uh, overwhelm the average internet connection. Um, but the any readings, any meter readings, uh, we monitor everything, fan speeds, temperatures, all that stuff. So yeah, you could certainly pull ambient temperature off an SNMP tap. Very good. Just it's just... Interesting to, that um, with a, such a comprehensive UI that uh, you have there, uh, bringing in other equipment over, over SNMP would be only software, quote, only software with no additional hardware. So it'd yep. be nice to bring everything together, but recognizing it, it is, uh, there is a cost. Well, the, the absolutely, because there's clock cycles and the big thing these days, right now, our engineering department they just hired 17 more of them. So I think they're pushing 70, 75 people over there now. And uh, it, it's, yeah, they're, they're nonstop. I mean, if I want something from engineering, I'm going to go in the queue, so to speak. So, Jack, yeah, yeah, we do prioritize a lot. Yeah. I noticed on your drawings, uh, you had one of the screens you could bring up was an audio processor. Is that only available if you have the Orban plug-in? Yes, yeah, what it is is the uh, front panel of the Orban 5500 just put on the screen, I believe, and I'll quantify that because Orban gave us the software and we uh, designed it into our board. Did I see somewhere that uh, the audio could come from a uh, stream over ethernet? You did. Yep. You can uh, run Shoutcast, Icecast, or Livewire, Axios Livewire, uh, directly into the transmitter. Now, I'll put a caveat on there. Um, let's see. Barry, if you go to Menu and go to Audio Player, yep, and then Streams up top. So at that point, if you hit add, uh, and I'm not going to add anything because I assume you don't have one to feed it, but if you click the type, so Livewire, Icecaster, Showcaster are all natively supported. Now there are caveats. Um, we don't have a clocking node in the transmitter, so your Livewire signal has to be clocked. So like you couldn't run the Livewire output from a zip IP, which doesn't use, do clocking either. 
but you could run if you had an IP link from studio to transmitter, you could run your Axia surface directly to the transmitter and just point it at the transmitter IP address. Um, so, you know, that's one thing. Uh, IceCast, Shoutcast, they have to be configured as servers, not as clients. And uh, if they're configured as public servers, that's easy. You can do MP3 or WAVE. It does not work well with any other kind of compression at this point. So uh, I know Barry is um, looking at uh, a BrickLink sort of uh, STL, and it'd be nice to avoid another box at the transmitter site, but um, yeah. I guess You're that interface is not there right now. No, um, no. I mean, that, uh, and that is something we have talked about. Uh, the challenge is at what point do you draw the line? Um, because there are a whole pile of them out there and some of them are proprietary, some of them are public and it, it just gets kind of ugly. So yeah, we decided to go with Shoutcast, Icecast because they were a little more ubiquitous, if you will. And then uh, Livewire because we've always had a, a working relationship with Telos. I say always for a lot of years anyway. What did, uh, the, um, there was a tab uh, marked playlists. What was that? Mm -hmm. So... This transmitter has a rudimentary automation system, plus the ability to play um, audio from a USB backup. So you could, uh, in addition to running streaming, you could plug a USB stick full of, I, I'd use MP3 files just because of space constraints, but an eight gig, M or eight gig USB will hold a lot of 256K MP3s. And you can build playlists. You can jump from one playlist to another. Like, for example, if you had a playlist that just had spots and another playlist that just had liners, then you could jump back and forth from music content and basically build an automation system. And as Barry's doing here, you've got the ability to get to it online so you can keep it with uh, fresh content. And that way, for the day that uh, the backhoe cuts your fiber, the transmitter can use its silence sensor to automatically switch you to the USB player and keep a signal on the air. If you keep the spot load current in it, then uh, it saves you some make goods too, depending on how many different spots you run. Very good. So silence sensor could switch you to this. Um, yep. Is there also a uh, silence sense to drop the RF maybe if you want to go that way? So the transmitter has multiple audio loss. It has two audio loss circuits. Uh, one is a one-way, one-time that is geared to switch you to the USB circuit or shut you off. Uh, for example, a translator that loses its source. Um, the other one is a, will switch you to the backup audio. And when the main audio comes back, we'll put you back on the main. Where do you want me to go for that? Okay, so let's see. Let's go back to sharing. There we go. Go to presets. And uh, we'll do this in current settings. Go to main audio. And uh, let's see. So you do not have, again, you don't have 5.3. I'm at to load my own. Go to other settings. So you don't have the um, go to the fallback and go back. But if you see the mod loss timeout there, that one, if you enable that, and we're not gonna save this so we can play with it. So right there, I tell it how far down and how long to be down before it performs whatever that action is. And the choices are change preset, which would be a preset with a different audio source, usually the USB backup, or inhibit the RF if again, a translator where I uh, don't wanna run it when I don't have a source. Unless, of course, I'm rebroadcasting an AM or an HD and then the rules don't apply, but that's a whole different uh, note. So um, anyway, uh, that's one of them. The one on the main audio tab, if Barry had uh, the next revision of software in this transmitter, that one will allow you to, it monitors the main audio. If the main audio goes below whatever you've got set in your um, system settings, then it will switch you to whatever you define as your backup audio source without physically changing the preset. And when the main audio comes back for a second, it will switch back to main audio. On that one setting, you have to have your modulation level is including pilot and RDS. So you have to set That's, that. 
That is the one in the other settings. The one yeah, where Barry's got uh, his, yeah. yeah. If you set it for zero and you're running stereo, it'll never sense it. Right. So for this one, for example, and, and Barry, that's something else you may want to do is uh, put a mod monitor on, uh, on their signal because I'm looking at your mod depth there and I'm willing to bet that you're running at about 90% mod. Do you have RDS turned on? No. Okay, so about 91% mod. Eh, no, a little less because you're not hitting 100%. Because your uh, that mod monitor up there includes the pilot. If you killed the audio, you should still see nine percent modulation on that display. Right. So, something to remember for next time you're out that way. I know ours. I just finally got it tweaked up too. But uh, yeah, absolutely. So on this one, you'd want the threshold to be at at least ten percent, and then pick whatever time period after that. If you're running RDS, you're going to want it probably at 12 and a half, 13 percent, assuming that you've turned up your analog to compensate for the RDS by the 50 percent margin you're allowed. Now, Barry, is this flamethrower in uh, Tucson? Yeah. So yeah, does it does so it does it send off a, an email? Is that that's a different setting? elsewhere that has to be configured it will only send an email if you tell it to send an email and we're not going to save this i say uh if you want no. to set that up we'll walk it walk you through doing that in a non-live setting yeah but uh but yeah the uh email configuration if you click menu again and go back to user settings that's not user settings that's user accounts <laughs> user to the right there you go um, so second one down is email configuration, and that's where you would put in all your email notification server, you know, whatever you give the, the uh, email address to it. Then when you go to notifications, yep, click it. It won't do it. I don't know. If, I don't know if it'll let you do it when you don't have email configured, but your screen appears to have gone. Oh, email server field is required. That's why. So yeah, it's probably locking you out because you don't have that set up. Hey, at least it's not blank. It's not no password. So that's a good sign. Oh, now this is, the, this is the part where he gets up and goes back and starts looking through the place where he wrote it down. Cause we, yeah. all, you know, and we all get told you don't write passwords down, but uh, I'm here to tell you if it wasn't for this little black brick in my hand, I wouldn't remember a single password to save my life. There's too many. Yep. Yep. And now and more and more, you get these things where you have to change it every three months. So I've gone through a rotating cycle. I have four levels of password, depending on the level. Like if it's just a something to get through a paywall, then I'll, I've got a, a disposable password that I don't care if it gets hacked. And then as I go up to, you know, to the more secure, like my bank, for example, is a much more complex password that, uh, but I, I tend to rotate them on, you know, they tell me it's got to change and okay, well, I'll make up a new one for the highest level. And then the next lower level will get that highest level's old password and I'll just work my way down the chain. Boy, Barry's back there digging. I'll, I'll tell you what, and, you know, well, he's got to get the password to get into his password keeper. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing of uh, changing password every so many days, I think is been... Uh, but it, it does not improve security. Uh, it does not. Tech, uh, yeah. Ars Technica did a big, no, no, it wasn't Ars Technica. I forget who it was. might have been Tech Radar, but there was a big study on it a few years back that uh, indicated that making people change their passwords on a periodic basis was actually less secure because it increased the chance they'd write them down where they could be found. Yeah, and the password manager, I think, I, I just use the one in, in Chrome, and everything mm -hmm. gets a totally random password. Uh, ideally, yep. nobody's going to break into my Chrome. Right. And, I mean, I do that for most things. Uh, for things like my banking and my credit cards, I've got a uh, biometric finger or um, fingerprint uh, plus uh, 128K, I think, encryption password file on my uh, phone. Now, that one, if it ever bricks, I'm hosed because, uh, I, of course, then again, I can remember my bank and credit card passwords. It's uh, things like Air Canada or United, those passwords. I need those written down somewhere. Well, you could get a tattoo. 
There's a wonderful idea. You don't want to change it every week. No. <laughs> or we just chop off your finger for the biometric. Yep, there you go. You had to figure out which finger to get to my phone. Actually, you've got a choice of two or three, I think. I forget how many I programmed into it. That's why your new nickname will be Lefty. Yep, well, that would be, be righty because I'm left-handed. I think there is legislation pending now uh, about equipment not having all the same default password. Uh, yep. so that people can't scam well, for It's funny. It's one of those hardware company launched into a software world. When we first came out with the AUI, we didn't think of that. We had a 24 character password for the Linux kernel and we just used the same password for everyone because I mean, it's buried in there. You know, you've got to SSH into it. Of course, when port 21 is wide open on the customer's end because we don't block it, that makes that a whole lot easier. So um, anyway, what changed that was the day on the, and uh, there'll be some people here that remember this, but the, the public radio technical forum, um, I'm on pod tech and somebody was like, hey, I uh, lost my user account and I need the root password to get into the Linux kernel. Does anybody happen to know what it is? And somebody said, oh yeah, here it is. And right into a public forum with it. And, uh, so I uh, fired a copy of that off to engineer and it said, yeah, we need to change this system and we need to do it now. So that, uh, that made for an interesting couple of days, but that got me on the priority list in the engineering queue for sure. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's not related to anything I did at all this time, which is on its own a small miracle and makes me want to go fix it. But uh, I will let you guys go and thank you very, very much for the time today. Well, thank, thank you, you very you. much. As always, Jeff, we look forward to your visits and wisdom and all the other good stuff. Well, more, more comedic entertainment value than anything else. But hey, we have some fun and that's all that matters. So have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you all soon. Take care. See you later. See ya. Bye, Jeff. Thanks.